Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with Larry Jackson. He invited me over, so I walked through a luge of horrible road conditions to get down here. Spikes on the boots. It's good what it's gusting about 35 to 50 today. Uh, just the classic southeast storm to melt away all the snow. Yeah. Watching your dock sway back and forth here. Um, how many times have you lost the dock? Well, we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> if we're going to talk about building, we want to talk about people that know what they're doing. <laughs> we'll also want to talk about weather a little bit. How often are you just nervous for your like dock? Like you have your dock down there, and then you have the the way that gets. Or t- tell people about what you have here. How you at what point do you hoist up your access to the dock, and and what do you got going on here? Well. You know, you're in a nice protected cove here at Knutson Cove and on Clover Pass. We're, so, we're kind of what we'd be on the lee side of Revilla Gagato. But the swells, when it blows from the west, we're facing due west. You'll get a westerly swell in here. And in, in the wintertime, we get these high-pressure northerlies that come from the north. So we kind of have a north exposure and a west exposure. So that's where we get beat up. Um, so we're right now you can see there's barely even a ripple on the water out here but um, so in the winter time we try to get all the boats out of the water and we hang the ramp up uh, in between two pilings so that you just don't get that the thing about the ocean is is relentless motion just constant motion and it will just wear things out docks uh, pilings, um, ramps, and so all we're doing by hanging the ramp and mitig- is mitigating that motion over the course of the winter with these westerlies and then the northerlies. It's amazing weather, and it's great to have like most of the year. But there's a couple of months here in the winter where it just it is awful, and so the wind doesn't totally always affect it. But this time of year, just it's pretty bad. Was it last year that? Uh, that was the last time, or two years ago was well, the last no, time you yeah, lost about the dock. a year ago, December, and, and uh, it's such it's a long. It's a. I have this had this pier here that I built out of wood, traditional creosote pilings on cement pads, and they were pinned in there and so forth. But it didn't have a lot of lateral hold down, as I guess what you'd have to say. So the wind would come rolling down the beach here on that southeast, and you'll just get whatever you get a 50 to even 100 mile an hour gust and laterally essentially just push the ramp the, the pier over they're not a lot of weight there's just the wood you know and didn't have a hold down so it was completely um armchair engineering so i i'm a believer in real engineers <laughs> and architects <laughs> but obviously i'm not on my own dock and we did it out of pocket and it was cheap but so rebuilding it wasn't that big of a deal just kind of a little bit embarrassing yeah so what are some of the other uh kind of bad winters any anytime you have what we've had the last week which was really cold temperatures in the teens and then warms up to snow it snowed what eight inches on saturday and then it rain it's been raining for about 13 14 straight hours so those eight inches are gone but it's just ice for good inch and a half two inches in in some parts of the road and i don't even know what it's like on the highway i d- wouldn't even bother driving around today yeah i drove down because the and the, the worry i always have with a lot of snow then rain on top of the snow is that snow like you heard about in petersburg this week you get that snow absorbing all the rain and it just be, it maybe becomes really heavy so i'm always worried about my canvases on my boats collapsing so i did drive down to air marine harbor and made sure the snow was off i did that last night while it was snowing and then again this morning but that's my biggest fear is yeah. it was is rain on snow and it'll collapse buildings but i think it, it was so quick to melt this time that i don't think you really have that kind of problem yeah it's definitely the best way for us to get rid of snow or the way that we get rid of snow the easiest is because we don't have those big warm-ups we get enough warm up to where it goes to rain and then the rain just kind of eats away at it but um we don't have snow all winter really it ends up being like a a couple a week or so maybe it'll 
it'll snow it'll get cold enough to freeze and it'll get that stale icy snow that just you know, horrible we're, we're alaska light here <laughs> yeah <laughs> well this is pretty stinking miserable and i have friends in fairbanks who said they'd, they'll definitely take negative 30 to 41 degrees and raining like it is here and then it's just going to be gray it's going to rain all week so it's going to be what the high is going to be 44 it's going to rain all week we're not going to probably see the sun or blue skies for at least 10 days so yep. they said they'd take the cold but being able to see the blue sky over this gray yeah that, that's just a uh you know it's a state of mind you have to either learn to live with it and and there's just a lot most people just can't handle the dreariness yeah i don't know i guess you get used to it growing up here i think it's made it a lot easier yeah i know definitely. it's abby definitely wants to get out of the house and do some walking running and things and it has been great walking and running weather and so she's kind of adjusting it's her She's been up here during the winter for about a month at a time, so it's the first time she's going to see and experience all of it, but uh, yeah, she's my, pretty hardy. My advice to almost anyone, and lots of people come here for whatever, you know, move here for work and do want to live the Alaska thing, and then I always tell them, well, it's not really, the weather can certainly bring you down, but really what's going to keep you here is people. So you have to create a network of friends and activities that give you life or you're just going to get sucked into a morass of <laughs> depression and misery. So, But that said, that can happen to you in a big city. It can happen to you in lots of places. Yeah, I think she's feeling that a little bit with the PhD stuff where she's just working on that stuff. And every day is like Groundhog Day just because same thing. Yeah. Just the same thing every day, chipping away at that. So as soon as she's uh, finished with that and uh, gets a job and things change a little bit, I think she'll be a lot more uh, excited for it. And then when the spring does start coming come around, the weather starts to get a little warmer. March starts to feel pretty good. We're going to have a, a long, uh, uh, a late snow, I'm sure, because we always do. But uh, Well, then you get the nice. opposite effect. You get that light you know and you get the long days and uh then it's 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 so uh, it's kind of the opposite in the sense of more life yeah so so and one of the biggest things that we're looking at right now is uh building and uh another reason i wanted to ha talk to uh, talk to you about this is we're in a in a crow's nest here of your custom build home on the ocean and um we talked a little bit off air about what my plans are or what Abby and I's plans are, are for building. Um, so how, how did you go, like what was your building process like for this thing? Well, it, it, it's interesting to, you guys picked this lot and so forth, but I was single. So um, when I bought this lot, and you guys are, you know, married couple now, and you can you, you you get to plan together. And so, in some ways, I was lucky in the, that I could I commercial fished, and I would I think I told you this in that one podcast. You know, I would just be out on my boat crabbing for the winter and uh, spend a bunch of time daydreaming about you know what my dream house was. So I did a lot of sketching, and then I started working with an architect and. And uh, we worked together. Uh, this was Linda Millard here in Ketchikan, and I really enjoyed it. And I wasn't worried about the time. The, I wasn't really in a hurry, so I could envision a house that would fit on this lot, that fit my kind of persona. And, and at the time, I had this wood mill, so it, you know, I could work with Linda. We could come up with ideas about how to use certain materials design the house around materials i mean we even designed the house to leave certain big there's a big huge spruce on the north side of the house here we left those cluster of trees so the house the house kind of took shape because of the way the lot is and and, and you find this in designs and i find it almost i find it a little frustrating for most of america we just have a lot and we say, okay, we're going to plop this house down on this lot. And in most subdivisions, that's kind of how it works. It doesn't really matter. It just looks a lot like the other houses. 
we often don't design for the locale, and that's what architects are trying to do. They'll say, okay, here's the features of the land, the, you know, the orientation to the sun, you know, the landscape, and you, and you take those strong points of that, um, and you design for it. And we, so we did that, and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, one of the things about when I live down south is you see these large developments where there's 50 or so houses. Every fourth or fifth house is pretty much the same thing. Right. When you are get, getting one of these homes, you do have choice in that you can have there's this house with these four or five variables, or there's this house with a couple of variable variables, and so I, mean, I guess it's pretty much the the same thing but they don't look exactly the same oh yeah we're, but it's we're it's, just in texas so they're just yeah. miles of these yeah know? and they're super super close you don't see that almost at all here um if there are any consistencies it's the materials but as far as that there's a lot of individualized yeah, architecture which is pretty cool and, yeah. and custom homes tend to cost more because there's nothing standardized and you don't know the price because it's custom you don't know how long the builder doesn't really know how long it's going to take them they're not going to give you per square you know like you go into a, a big market like we were there in the in the fort worth area well they know that a house is going to cost x amount per square foot just because they know the building material labor costs the material cost you know and unless you're way out in left field they just know it's going to cost x amount of dollars here you you try to do a custom home you just, everybody's going to tell you okay it's going to be cost of materials plus my labor or, you know cost plus they call it is that kind of where you guys got with your guy or yeah so um my builder is a good friend of mine rob buckingham who i grew up with on prince of wales and uh, he's built a couple homes he was down in thompson falls for a little bit after high school and went to montana state and then uh he was doing floors for a lot of those big homes just outside of Bozeman and mm -hmm. Livingston. So yep. he's worked on some really beautiful homes and moved back up here. Um, he actually came to, he and his wife came to visit me on Prince of Wales. And then it was perfect weather. Took my little skiff Sucker out. Catching, yeah, yeah. And he, he was like, oh, we're moving back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with the, within a year they had. Sucker. So, um, yeah, it was awesome. They, they built the house and so he's been around. He's been doing a lot of jobs. And so uh, he's going to be the builder. And, the, the nice thing is he wants things individualized, but he's not into, I don't know, like luxurious. He wants purposeful. Right. And that's what, that's great. Practical. And they ended up being, you know, just far under budget, which is, which is good because, uh, you know, Abby and I, you know, we're, we want to stick to, uh, stick to the budget and then right. uh, have some stuff. We don't want to be house poor where everything goes into, well, the other thing that. is, you, you guys, you have a moving target, too, as a couple. You don't know if you're going to stay or whatever. Is that kind of... So, you know, pour your heart and soul into one house, mm -hmm. and then, like, five late years later, you're out of here. Yeah. Well, and that would be the... It wouldn't be super bad. You know, if we get this finished in, in a year, and then if Abby has a really good career opportunity somewhere else, um, you know, we'd have some, some equity. But, uh, you know, even if, even if we are here... Um, you know, just maybe this is just a great experience, and maybe the next one we do and it ends up being, you know, a little different, better, or whatever. Is this like the dream house? That uh, I, you know, the, 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 it's interesting. You, once you get in the house, you learn about the, you know, the house takes on a life of its own, a character of it. And I wonder, would I do something different? Well, you can't really know that because when you plan a house, you're you are who you are at the time. You can't see into the future. Um, so yeah it is my dream house but now I, i'm kind of i have fun with it i think if i there's certain other properties if i if i had them i'd build a whole different house because hmm. i the, the other things that intrigue me about um alaska you know I, I i like things that are not necessarily normal so um, even though this has got a lot of normal features and the timbers and so forth we you know we added little custom things here and there but I think one of the things that is intriguing about, like, here, we build these big riprap walls, you know, that you backfill on and make pads, these big stones. Mm -hmm. So I've always thought, why doesn't everybody build a house with these things? You know, so mm. things like that. Like, uh, take the features of the land and use them in the building here. 
Yeah. Um, I know there's probably a reason it's expensive and it's not practical and all those other reasons. But uh, I think if I had another lot, I would do something with stone. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have just to point out some details. You talk about using the land and kind of incorporating there. Like your home is in the trees and then you have to go upstairs. You walk through a right. tree um, that's it, dead. And you have an uh, old fireman's pole near. Yep. You have a lot of reclaimed wood from around town. Yeah, we tried to take... This was a feature when building. I, I, I went to buildings that I knew were going to be either torn down or not. And so I, I, there's four or five different buildings in town that no longer exist, but they're, they're materials in this house. Uh, one is the old pulp mill. Um, one is the um, Norby building. Which is no longer down. It was down by City Float. There's one on the um, Paul Hansen building, which is now the Sockeye Sam's building. I have some material out of there. Uh, the flooring right below our feet right here is out of the BB Cannery, which is also called Butterfront Storage. And uh, that's the four or five of those buildings that are in this house. So I think it's kind of fun. It kind of gives you a little history in your house. The, the tree is an interesting feature in the sense that. It, I think it, it came from the idea of these house poles in the longhouses mm -hmm. where you would go through them, you know. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool to go through a house or go through a tree, walk through it. And I originally was telling Linda, the architect, well, I want to put that in the center of the house and we'll go up through this kind of passage through this tree. And you go up and you'll be, because I commercial fished a lot on Saners, you go up on the top house, you go through a hatch door or whatever in these in these. And you come out into this wheelhouse, and I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool. You go through a tree, and you come up, and it, you'd be in this kind of setting that we're in now, and you're, you're kind of like in a wheelhouse. And then, But I also had this other competing desire that I wanted to go have my main floor down at the deck level or the what we'd call the beach level or whatever. So the entry level was second floor. So Linda said, well, why don't we take this tree idea, and we'll use it to descend and that's how it is now. So you descend down through this tree and you come out into this great room kind of idea. So that was, was that was her idea. That's so, awesome. And then yeah. you have some rock work down there. Where'd you get those? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. You can go out on a beach, and I don't know if it's legal, but we just went, <laughs> <laughs> just went over to the beach on, on Benton Island here. And there's uh, one beach where, you know, it's exposed to the surf. And they're like river rock tumbled rocks. And uh, we would just went on low tide and we, it's labor intensive, gathered up a bunch of these nice tumbled big boulders, brought them here. And that's the wraparound for the wood stove area there. And then, then there's a kind of terrazzo path through the house. And we went and found um, rocks from the beaches. We just went out and got like, you know, river stone or beach stones, little ones, pebble size. And that's the whole terrazzo's floor there and we incorporated a lot of different items that we had friends bring and we put in that floor and then we used rock from uh, gary mcwilliams who used to have stone arts of alaska mm. over you in, craig? in craig you know I, you've probably been to his place oh yeah i don't think he's out there anymore but no. anyway uh we went out there we made a special flight over there one day just to go through his whole yard and, you know he's so eccentric that he had all this stone from all over prince of wales really cool stuff and we said well we want our backsplash in the bathroom to be this certain stone and so he sliced and diced this rock and made back backsplash for us and uh he made a halibut cut out for our pathway down there out of this green stone you find in the pits over there or some of the rock pits and uh, uh i wish to had more stuff that he had because mm -hmm. he had some really cool you know um uh, aphrodite stone that was kind of a a fossilized shell i think or whatever it was anyway he had the, all sorts of stuff that would be it's fun if you had a lot of money and time you could just yeah <laughs> you know put it in your house is is it cost effective or time effective to do a lot of the stuff because it seems no, like going out and <laughs> collecting your own rocks yeah uh, what about like in in the time that it takes but uh, i mean you do get on the on the back side you end up getting a you know a very individualized house like what about Resale. Not that you would be excited well, about resale. Are you, you know, worried said, about that at all? I think, uh, you know, that's a, that's a catch. I don't know. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. 
So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them and using their service, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. I was hesitant about having to get a new phone and a new phone number, but with Mint, you can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone and your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for a family, and at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and to get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com/waypoint. That is mintmobile.com/waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. But you might not even care because like this is your house. Yeah, I don't really to care about over. whether it makes an added value. I do think that if you do have good architecture and good building materials and some integrated art into your house, it will add to the value of your house. But really building it with good quality materials is probably the best part. Um, but one thing about the... the the doing something with you know the, you guys are outdoors you love to hunt you you know um you like to be out on in, in an ex- i think you need to bring and i don't mean just wall mount kind of deer mount that you, that you can put that in any house once the house is done you throw your um you know your rack on the wall and the date and time whatever but i think you could put some features in and and think about them like we we have this thing that we pulled off the beach over here, like the handrail on our stairs is just a log we found walk, walking mm-hmm. on the beach. The pot rack above our stove is uh, we just found those you know dried up root wad on the beach that's been weathered. Just took a chainsaw over there and hacked a chunk of that you know root wad off, which makes this great thing to hang pots on. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you can do these kind of things that don't like really take a lot of time. But they add kind of that, you know, a little touch that you guys, being really outdoorsy, um, would it would it would be you, I guess, add add that character to your house. Yeah, it's funny to go to a Cabela's or even like an interior design place or even look online and they have these fake versions of that, like rustic this that you're paying for. It's kind of like when you go to you look at distressed jeans on Abercrombie yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It's just like, well, it's, it's like someone wore these for 15 years and now they're selling it because it's vintage. Whereas same thing with interior design, you could get this old looking thing for a whole bunch more money because of the style <laughs> where you could actually find the thing yourself and use it yourself. Yeah. It, and, and some of it is, I guess what you're describing is kind of cliche, you know, the lodge look it's very, it's kind of in now, like the slab thing, like a slab, um, mantle you know that it, it does add a kind of outdoorsy kind of look and and then it be, and then it becomes so in that it now is kind of oh now it's just another house with a slab mantle you know everybody has those but yet if you like the look you know there, there's no no harm no foul and in, in, enjoy it and um but the other thing is i i think sometimes you get get too cluttered and maybe we we push that envelope the other w- thing to think of is don't plan everything so like this, you look behind us and our we have this kind of lofted library thing there. Um, that was not in our plans. We added that later just from, you know, necessity to have a place to put books. So we designed it and built it and had a friend. You know, if you leave some area for future ideas, then you can go, oh, yeah, a year or two later, hey, let's do this. Let's build a little, you know whatever your trophy room or you know mm-hmm. that kind of thing yeah we're looking at opportunities now that we have like kind of what what's going to work and now we're going to look for ways that we can kind of um individualize this for things which would be cool but also it's you know there's a lot of things that you don't even know to think about until like afterwards 
where you see other people's homes and you get some ideas. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's gonna be fun to do it ourselves. But you know, when I when I say do it ourselves, like Rob's gonna do the building. We're just gonna be like cleaning up. I'm not gonna try to say or or do stuff that I don't uh, I don't know how to do. Like I would probably stay away from a nail gun, things like that. <laughs> but uh, well, I mean, there's there's lots of stuff. You know, the the thing that no builder likes to do is put insulation in the cavities of the walls. Mm -hmm. No one's no, they don't. I mean, like stocking the sheetrock. Uh, there's there's this kind of you know strong back, weak mind component to building a house that they're gonna they're gonna, you, you'll fit right in on that. Uh, <laughs> but it, here's the thought I had about this whole um, uh, you know building with your um oh i lost my train of thought it was something about how you can use your local you know character to to build your house and not plan too much mm -hmm. sometimes things get from like unique to almost weird i don't think anything in your place is weird i think it's unique and purposeful thanks and pretty for, sweet thanks for saying that yeah i just <laughs> want to make sure clarify yeah but i yeah i think southeast or alaska in general probably southeast a lot too is you get some almost bizarre type ideas that are really specific to that person but anybody else you'd think i don't know if that I doesn't want to really yeah. live here well, but. so one thing. Oh, here's what I, I just recovered my thought. It went down. It went, <laughs> you know, I, I just pulled it back out of the ravine. Good. Um, it was it, as I sat and envisioned certain pla places in this house, like where we're sitting now, or like a little room back there that Josephine has. I tried to envision myself sitting in the room and like, how will I feel? Will I, you know, will it take me out? Like this is kind of one of those. I thought I could sit here and daydream, and that's exactly what I do. Drink a coffee, and I could daydream. Um, maybe you know, I thought about the little bedroom there, a little loft for kids to sleep in. Kids like to feel cozy. Uh, they don't particularly need a big room. They just need a room that feels cozy, and that's kind of what I envisioned in that. So it's a counter to intellect. It's more about an emotion. What does it invoke in you? And it's kind of like a, a way to think about building your house. If I sit there, what am I? I don't think people design that way really, fairly well. I mean, a, sometimes they do. They have a breakfast nook. There's a nice little place to sit where you have your coffee and eat your breakfast. Yeah, we have a little nook in the in the master. Yeah, that same sort of purpose as this. It's not going to be as big as this, and it's going to be different because it's going to be in the master and it's not accessed anywhere else. But just that that space to just kind of sit and read if you want. Um, another thing that I'm, I'm figuring out is it's difficult to understand how big or to picture how big an area is yeah. until I was Very putting hard. in like the, the, um, you know, your queen size bed or like a couch or things like that. It fills hard. it up. Yeah. Like yeah. all of a sudden, Oh geez, oh, here's a pretty good size garage. And then, you know, you could fit a Prius in there or like a, <laughs> yeah, right. you know, a Dodge Dart. Two bicycles. Yeah. And a wagon yeah so it's what i thought you know what would, would be a good closet ended up being a huge closet but then the room that i had was too small so right. those sort of size things so um, well the other thing i find is that like I, I thought about and i even when we're designing this i realized i didn't really have much of a view of the water from our master bedroom and i thought well how much time do i sit in my master bedroom and stare out at the ocean well i don't really so I, I like I don't really care if I have a view there. So there's things like that. That how much time do you really spend in your bedroom? I, I I don't. But does that mean if you designed a bedroom that was more homey, you might spend more time there? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's that kind of thinking, and I, I think that you know, it's not like the bathroom. Or really, how much time do you want to? Do you really need to <laughs> design yeah. a bathroom to be a palace? Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. If you're gonna use it to you know do your thing. When I originally drew the upstairs, I had the master bedroom because of the way that it faces. I had the master bedroom um, on the north side just because you know days like this, my buddy Rob's master bedroom that has you know it's that southeast facing. It's just getting hammered by wind, wind and rain. And rain. Yeah. And so like it, yeah. You know, how did he sleep last night when it was blowing forty oh. fifty? It it's, is. So I originally put it on the other side, but then I thought, well, the other side, then we, we were putting the master bath, because it's not a really big space, we're putting the master bath over there, 
And then you're going to have like no windows on that side, yeah. which is kind of weird. And then you're going to have any much, very that much a light in there. So big design faux pas, in my opinion. Put a bathroom on the view wall. <laughs> yeah, do so not do that. We end, end up ended up flipping, flipping, uh, flipping the master bath. So now, or the master back, and so now the master bedroom is going to be. It's going to be a lot more light. We're going to be able to see out. But that at least was the the mindset going in was to just like you were saying, like how much you, time do you spend in your master bed, and then again designing it like you said earlier about you know to your location yeah. like are we going to get less sleep because the wind is just going to hammer those windows all night so a lot of things go into that um but i'm um, pretty pretty excited to see how it how it turns up and um see how many things i overanalyze, overthink or outthink myself one thing that i learned that i can i mean i have a few regrets on this design and one of them that is kind of underrated here in Southeast is really covered outdoor space. Now you think of it for carports, you know, we we have this carport or we garage, or like we have a little covered side porch, which we, you know, have a bar, you know, barbecue on and a little bit of storage or whatever. But my friend Sean, and God, I hope he doesn't listen to this and, and hear me praising his design, but <laughs> he he did a complete wraparound covered porch on his house and he knew the he knew the kind of the advantages of having this covered outdoor space because you know, there are a lot of times when you just kind of do want to be outside for whatever reasons uh, to enjoy an evening you know or whatever and even in the summer here even when it's cold and windy or rainy sometimes you want to be outside mm -hmm. you know so uh, that that's a nice little thing that if you have the time or you have the space to have more covered outdoor space yeah that's definitely something we want to incorporate we might not have that on the first go round, but we're going to yeah. design the house where we can go outside just that grilling thing and then yeah the air is always going to be fresh up here it might not be warm it might not be dry but it is going to be fresh and so there are times you just want to kind of go outside and smell the cedar well even practical things like drying out rain gear um or you know beach stuff or outdoor clothing um just more space outside You're hanging up a tent um to dry uh the outdoor covered space you you utilize it all yeah we had a hot tub at the place in cloak and it was under a covered like half the deck was covered and it was great because then you could yeah be in the hot tub and you were you were outside of the outside right. of the rain i know the romantic notion is being out in the hot tub under the northern lights and while it's snowing it's, well yeah, so that sounds one. real nice, but that's not going to happen here. <laughs> yeah, one day out of the year, maybe. Have you seen the Northern Lights from from here? Oh, like, yeah, on a, on a clear night. You know, certainly can walk out on the pier and see them. Yeah, um, if you get... Um, like fours and fives are pretty, pretty much right above mm -hmm. us. But for the most part, a lot of those twos and threes... Well, we're looking due... This is almost due west. Yeah. So... The northern lights are north, yeah. so you, they're they're kind of a little bit, you know, north. Yeah. If you have a different orientation, you're going to have a better view. Those, um, I don't know. Do you know what scale those go up to? I don't. I yeah, don't I'm really talking know. about the, they have this northern lights. Where is uh, that rated out of? The Geologic, Geo, whatever institute in oh, Fairbanks. Interesting. They have this little website, and so they, they will, there's a forecast. Mm. And like ones and twos are very low, and so you have to look very north, and probably have to have your shutter open for like a minute to see any sort of green on the horizon. But if it's like a four or five, then you can look pretty much straight up and see them. Oh, okay. When okay. I was living down at Mitchell's, yeah, he's pretty much in the shadow of of those mountains, and so he has right. no northern view. But there were a couple of days I think it was at a at a four or five, oh, interesting, yeah. where I could see them from there, and that was just because it was they were so far south, it was pretty much straight up rather than half and have that northerly well, view. you know our pitfall here obviously is just overcast skies so yeah. you know we're 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 lucky to get a few yeah. northern light shows a year abby was really excited because i told her that the week before we left that friday or actually no, the week that we did leave it was the 16th or the night of the 16th i think it was supposed to be a five or six so like a really really good day should have been the day that you just look straight up and it had been clear the whole week mm -hmm. but that was the day that it clouded yeah, up right. and so it should have been you know maybe one of the top two or three days for the year of northern lights and it was uh it was cloudy so back to your building you know one thing we 
I mentioned er, uh, pre on the air here was people building uh, new builds. New builds for a young couple or any couple tend to um, bring about a, a lot of anxiety. And there's these, these, and even when we built this house, we were newly married. I mean, I didn't say we, I wouldn't say we fought or anything about it, but it added anxiety because you have the money pressure of trying to spend within a budget. You have the decision, the, the big thing that gets people is the amount of decisions you need to make. This t type of paint color, this type of uh, countertop, you know, and so on. I mean, it's almost like the, the gluttony of decision in some mm -hmm. way. And, and, you, and then you're having to make these decisions uh, on, as a couple, and that adds, adds some tension. And then you're, you know, just adding that to your normal work level so that you have a regular you know career so you you know most of the time people need time to just shut down at night or after they especially worked with kids all day and they want to kill them <laughs> so then they got to go home and work on this house and so um i'm just uh aware that to be aware of that i guess yeah we and we've talked about that um and there's obviously you can talk about it all you want but until you're actually dealing with it, that's going to be a whole different thing but um uh, but I mean, have you run into the, or you know, obviously you already had to make some decisions. You made a decision to buy the lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you made a decision to pick a builder? You made a, you decided a certain design. So far, those are all fairly big decisions, and they've been fairly stress-free or not stressful. Or, or it's been it's been it's been stressful, but also I think exciting too because we're moving forward with this, and so any sort of stress has been I think overcome with just. The, the excitement. excitement that we're yeah, that we're getting good. moving on it, which good. is which is good so far. But yeah, I think two potential huge pitfalls are a the stress. You know, we're newly married, and yeah. I have my job, and she's in the process of you know trying to start finishing. her career yeah. while she's finishing up her PhD, and then working. Anytime you go into business with or you're working with a friend, that can be a problem too. Sure. So you know, having a, a close friend of mine uh, be the builder, you oh, know yeah. that, yeah. and so. Um, That'll that'll be that'll be interesting, but I think uh, I think we're alike in enough ways, we're different in enough ways uh, as as friends and builders that I think that's going to work out well. And then we put in the contract that we aren't Rob isn't going to be depending upon us for any of the work. So we are going to okay. Yeah, the right. more we're involved, we are the better. So we go there and we clean up, we do that stuff, and it helps out the process. But right. he's not going to have to wait for us to... Yeah, you're not going to paint the rooms, or you're not going to do a certain thing. He's going to just... Yeah, he's going to do that. I think there will... I think that's that's a smart decision. Certain yeah. opportunities, we might end up painting the rooms at the, at the end, yeah. or doing those sort of things. But as far as, you know, okay, Rob, hold it, wait until I'm done with school. Right, to, so I can do this I want a thing, picture yeah. of me raising the roof so yeah. that, you know, I can say that I built it and... yeah put that on on social media it's like yeah, and then we also put in the contract that if he needs to hire help you know because he's putting up the walls and i'm at work and, and abby's yeah. at work and you know he can so there's no those sort of inefficiencies um he's been pretty good with addressing and he and we didn't want to work without a contract even though we are friends because yeah, he didn't good. want so the contract, everything's spelled um, out that's good yeah so i think we're in, in pretty good shape there but yeah i'm sure there's going to be some some stressful things but as as of right now we're pretty we're abby's not super demanding you know she doesn't want i need to have this i need to have that it's she's pretty low uh that's pretty good that's, maintenance, that's, which is nice. that's helpful because you know i i was dealing with a prima donna here you know and she's, <laughs> <laughs> no, i'm teasing but i was actually see you know leslie teases me because you know that the the typical trope is that in, when people get married the bride is the one you know with all the high demands and I'm, she said in our our marriage i was i was <laughs> i was groomzilla yeah. i was the one that wanted the 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 wedding on the beach you know and then i had the already had the design for the house so i she was already she was talking me out of my <laughs> fantasies like this bridge right here behind us i wanted to have a rope swing out to this Ooh. you know or a drawbridge I had all sorts of, uh, you know, kind of childish, 
aspects. <laughs> so would you have had this the plank to get out here plus the rope swing, or would that be the only way you get out know. here? We, we never got that <laughs> far. <laughs> never got that far. <laughs> but I did, I did have, I did want to, I thought it was so cool since we lived on the ocean. I wanted to have a saltwater aquarium as mm-hmm. one of the walls oh. so that I could have, you know, critters swimming around there yeah. and then have water. When that got, that got vetoed. So if she ever dies, that's the first thing that's going in. Go to salt water. Wow, yeah. that's, that's pretty nice. Yeah, yeah you could. I mean, we're looking straight down, like underneath our feet. We could suck the water almost, right off the yeah. ocean. You it's know? almost the start of the beach right there. Yeah, you got a pretty steep drop off. Yeah, um, which is great for a dock and yeah. so forth. So, how long is the the plank out to your dock? The pier, the pier? is about um, eighty feet, I think, and then you know you got about a sixty foot ramp. And then, yeah, then the dock. So, and that, you know, you don't have a lot of actual, I mean, uh, beach. One of the reasons I was excited about this lot is you don't have a lot of um, these type of lots where you have a short, hard beach and then a drop off with a soft bottom to put pilings in. Mm. So, I mean, that's a, if you go, let's say, from starting right here at Knudsen Cove and then go back towards town, you won't see this um, type of uh, geology to uh, afford this till you get to about probably Refuge Cove. Oh, wow. Because it's either a big sandy beach or it's too exposed to rough water beach or you're, you know, you just don't have that right. Or it's just a, a cliff. Yeah. Yeah, this is a really nice nook up here. Um, I was reading a little bit about Ketchikan history, and it used to be kind of four different communities. You have Ketchikan, mm-hmm. and then you kind of had Ward Lake or Ward Cove. Wacker City. Where's that? That was Ward Cove. That was Ward Cove? Yeah. Then that was obviously not connected out here to Knudsen Cove, and then right. you had Loring as its own thing, which yeah. was kind of the... I don't know. It kind of sounded like that was almost the big city at one Loring, point. Loring, I think, at the turn of the century, was, was bigger than Ketchikan. Hmm. It had a big cannery there, and it was, you know, it, it, for whatever the reasons, Ketchikan became bigger than Loring. And Loring, I think probably the demise of the cannery was probably the reason. I think it burned or something. It seems like there's a little bit more room to grow around here. Um well, it's because of the, the nature of the land, so ownership. Um, the borough owns land all the way out to Mosier Bay, and so you can see where they've subdivided parcels out there, and it would be just a matter of a road, and you'd have more land. And then you have lots that are on the drawing board but aren't accessible back there by um, Mud Bite up the Rhea Road subdivision, they call it. And so you have these subdivisions, and you can even see it now all the way over into Valiner Bay, all those recreational lots mm-hmm. that almost have roads to them now. So it, it is a, you know, it's an interesting thing because, like, you go to Texas and it's almost all private. Crazy, him on a, yeah. A, and you come here and it's public. And, and I'm, you know, I'm going to betray my leanings here, but I like it. I like the public. The, the fact that nobody's going to buy Benton Island here and put a subdivision in means that I'm pretty much secure in having this view, well, at least for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy how different everything is down there, um, especially when it comes to hunting. Well, you have, to, you have pretty much the, the only way to go now as far as locating area that you can hunt efficiently, effectively, and, you know, responsibly is to have some sort of app on X or something like that that mm-hmm. tells you would, whose land you're on. Because right, did you just cross over from uh, BLM land to state land and then actually went into someone's private land? Are you on a ranch right now? Mm-hmm. It's so hard to tell where you're standing. But up here, like, it's, we go anywhere. Like, so when you really guys did matter. your hunt, like, for an elk and so forth, was it was in Wyoming? Yeah, we do. Was that on public land? Yeah, it was on public land. And there was, where we hunted for mule deer, there was a a couple slivers of BLM land that was sandwiched, you know, in 10, 15, 20 miles in every direction by private. It was just, and there was, you know, a couple places had some some fences, but even the BLM had some fences. So this whole idea of the the, kind of wild go out and, it's a little bit of a, 
misnomer that the, the hunt now has become almost a privatized hunt in the yeah. vast majority of America. It's th there's there's a there's some large swaths of land that are up in the mountains and the foothill area like that stuff was you know, long ago became ranches, and then the lower lands you know as they were the railroad was going through. Um, that stuff got bought up, and so that stuff's been private for a very long time. Then you had the large ranch, the cattle ranches, and then the farms and everything. So that stuff has been checkered out and bought for so long. And what is the main problems with uh, animal migration has become just the roads that went in, then the property boundaries, and then right. the fences, fences and everything like yeah, that. So right. um, huge problems. But when you get up into the mountains, the Snowy Range or the, the Big Horns, um, then you get larger swaths of of public land, which is cool. So you can hike oh. back, and you can, you know, find a nice little corner where there might be uh, elk or, or mule deer or something. But there's also a lot of roads back there, mm -hmm. and so, you know, we can access like Prince of Wales has a lot of logging roads. So you can get around to a lot of different areas down there. There's just a lot of roads, so tons of people. But it's nice up here where you can hike in from a road, and man, you're probably not going to see anybody. But at the same time, you know, you, you think you take your boat across to this island, you go into this little cove, anchor up, and you're going to hunt this muskeg. Well, someone else has probably scouted that too. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's nice to have it just open in your front yard, backyard. Yeah, yeah I, I, I guess growing up in case you can, I've kind of in some ways taken public lands for granted. So, you know, you always get this large political debate about, you know, the access, the development of public lands. And um, I just finished a book on the Grand Canyon, which I mentioned. And, you, and I'm taking for granted the guy that, or the group, the Sierra Club, that actually preserved a lot of that, you know. And you think, well, what, what would have happened if they hadn't done that, you know. We would have a whole different perspective of public lands, so... Um, anyway, I, this this podcast wasn't really about public land. <laughs> but. No, I, I think it's 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 valid in that one of the biggest problems that we had was that Abby and I had was finding land that was kind of affordable for us. Right. Well, there you um, go. And you know, if there was a lot that was, you could buy a lot for for cheaper that's undeveloped. So then right. you got to get it. You got to get it cleaned out. You got to get a pad in, and right. you know you could be looking at a hundred thousand dollars easily of, of rock work. Right. So you buy something that already has the rock work done. You know you're hoping for something you could afford. And so in our case, something maybe weird had to be with it. Like we wanted obviously a structurally sound pad, not something that you know they just pushed over some some fill in and right. covered it with some gravel and so it's going to rot stump and sink. Stump dump, as we yeah. used to call it. Uh, stump dump, I like that. Um, but, you know, the one that we have, there's a right-of-way that goes past someone's house, so it's not, you know, super... It's not super secluded and there's a right-of-way that you have to kind of deal with and it's on the borough website, so it's legit and it's, you know, wide. It's not like a small and little it wagon trail. has point access to uh, yeah. the sewer, the point, mountain point sewer. Yeah. yeah. Um, doesn't have a view, so you know something that we could afford. It wasn't going to be this perfect spot, and you know there's not a whole lot of lots that can be developed or or build ready available right. at this point. Um, that is the irony in the state, the, the largest state in the country, that the really land is expensive. Yeah, and um, and that's probably a feature of it having a lot of public land, and so you know, it, and it's also a feature of how. Um, expensive is to develop land yeah. here too yeah the um you know we we're talking about valner a little bit earlier and there's a lot of flat land there that you could build on because one of the things you like ketchikan downtown ketchikan area it's that's pretty much maxed out <laughs> yeah. right that's why in juno there's, there's like nothing left house yeah. prizes there are astronomical and yeah. building there is astronomical too but around here valner is a one of the better places to develop but because there's no bridge to there you know a lot of people who bought those lots in the in the valner area um I, i've been saying valner i mean gravina uh, gravina, gravina island there's no bridge to gravina so anybody that wanted to build a home and you know drive to work or whatever like you can't do that so yeah and it, it and those were a lot of times were developed from the state point of view as recreational lots where you'd put a cabin or whatever but you know the the debate became well do you build a 200 million dollar bridge to 
access more lots. And, and that, I, that really, I mean, that was part of the debate, I think, at the time. I don't know if it would have brought, because the, the minute you put a bridge in, then the price of the property would have gone up. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it may have answered the question. It would have accessed more lots, but it would have, I don't know if they had been more affordable. But. Yeah. We thought about that briefly. We thought, hey, we could save some money on a lot. Do we want to commute on the water? Yeah, yeah just if, if there's a way that we can get to the airport ferry in the morning, yeah. then just kind of shoot over or, you know, take a skiff. But, man, those dark days in in the winter when you're driving to, to, driving to school, I can't imagine doing it in a skiff. And there's always, you know, a couple of students every year or every couple of years that takes a skiff from Pennick in the morning and, you know, it's it's well, dark. Well, we watch them go we by here every day. But not students. I mean, yeah. people commute from out here in Clover Pass. Yeah. And I see them go by every day in their skiffs. And so, I mean, it's it's a way of life. Yeah. I mean, you have to um, value that. And yeah, those those high winter tides, we just get a lot more junk mm -hmm. in the water. They're getting and then into, you know, cold and oh man, that's that's tough, but. Yeah, no, like you said, it's part of the way of life here and part of the part of the appeal. You know, you go to most of these southeast towns have a off road component. You know, Petersburg has the Wrangell Narrows of people and there's lodges and people you know, you Wrangell, there's Tom's place and other places off the road system there that people they live close enough to town, they're a skiff rider right way. But, you know, they you know, Sitka's got that. I don't know about you know so much but uh most of these towns have that component and, you know there's the diehards that are coming in on a skiff every day or every other day or whatever yeah there's a couple spots that are right outside of cloak where, where people would come in from either wadley or mm -hmm. you know and it's yep. um or people would, would come in just from they would live out the road right. and so they wouldn't take a skiff in but they would just drive in once a week get their supplies and then sure. their, their kids were homeschooled or whatever and i don't know uh just a unique way of life and you have a lot of independent uh opportunities here so yeah well what else you got man we're uh, it's close to an hour so uh, is that what we had to fill was a whole that hour was, well you know i aim for about 20 minutes it well, always goes longer like than 20 minutes of this out right no oh, no <laughs> yeah. no no this is the authentic look i don't uh i don't do much editing i'll try to edit well, for sound well i i've i've been a part of the building since I got back here in the early 90s, I helped build a few houses over time. And then, I, of course, I supplied building products to um, builders and homeowners for close to 15 years with my little wood business. And I I think it's, it's you know, it's the one thing that a couple or a family does that really, um, it builds their wealth, you know, if you own a home. It um, is kind of the, a, a unique, unique American thing to own a private home. Um, people uh, really enjoy wood, and that's why I was so. I, and I, I enjoyed the whole wood thing. So it's it's a it's a fun thing. I, I'm glad you guys are doing it, and then that you have the attitude you're having that you're, you know, you you find it exciting, and and uh, hopefully you don't get overwhelmed and. And it uh, becomes miserable because I've heard those stories <laughs> too. But um, I just think I, I really want to encourage people to try to use the local stuff that they can find because we have these beautiful woods, these soft woods, the spruce, hemlock, red and yellow cedar, little dabble of uh, alder. But if they can, go out and try to find some sources. I know there's people milling it usually on POW. There's a guy out of Haynes. Um, you know, there's not much going on here locally although there's a few guys sawing here locally in Ketchikan but um, using the local woods just so that you can support the industry and and the and the look yeah that uh, wood that Dave Smith has been working on that oh, yeah. uh, that's beautiful and the stuff yeah. that he's it's funny that it came from a water tower oh he got, just, yeah he got some of that stuff but that was actually red wood from I think California, uh, California yeah. yeah yeah crazy that you know the use of redwood, which we cherish right now, <laughs> was yeah. like for for a water tower in town. Yeah, well, there there I remember I got a water tank because a lot of the old um, cisterns were made out of these uh, cedar redwood, I should say, um, and so people would dismantle them and put in the plastic or galvanized tanks, and then 
uh, they'd salvage the staves. And I've, I've, I've worked with several of those old water tanks. A little gust there. Yeah, I wonder if it's picking it up on the... This is pretty good, pretty good equipment here, but I wonder if there's going to be a little... Little wind background, It'd be authentic. Yeah. Your eye and your uh, ramp right there. It's a no, swaying I just back like and seeing forth. the willow waws. They come over the top mm. of the hill and they hit that water and they do this snaky thing as they go across the water. There, you know, you kind of see the whole um, chaotic nature of um, wind on the water when it. Yeah. Um, it's. It's horrifying when you're actually out in it, but it's so <laughs> nice when you're sitting here in the confines of a warm living room. Yeah. To, well, when it comes from this angle, too, it doesn't have that chance to build. So if you're out south, you're just going to see the massive waves that are coming in. Yeah. Whereas here, because we're right next to it, it's coming up and over. It's not like yeah coming in at us. So you we're can see the, the waves a lot it. more. Yeah. yeah. You know it's a stormy, like on a most, most rainy events, we don't even get water on these windows. But when mm -hmm. you got a big storm like this, you'll see water on these windows wrapped around. So, yeah, it starts to white cap out there so a little bit. You guys are gonna just back to your house. You're gonna start building in the spring. You have a time. Do you have have kind of a timeline set up? It's gonna take a year, nine months. Yeah, the loan is for uh, for one year, so we have to get it done within a year. But um, ideally, we'll be in there for Thanksgiving. So if we're in by Christmas, I'll be happy. <laughs> So hey, uh, you just got to budget it in, right? You, you just got to assume. You just realized you, you you hit upon the like number one trope in house house building. We're going to be in by Christmas. I mean, literally that in every builder's <laughs> nightmare. That is the line they they hear. Yeah, well, we hope to be in by Christmas. Well, the hope is Thanksgiving, so I figured by going back one holiday, then you that, would, go that would it's got okay. Easter. You got to just say yeah, we're going to be in by Easter. <laughs> well, that will be uh, over a year. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. yeah, so we're going to try to, rather than start in the summer, we're going to start as soon as the ground thaws. So ideally uh, March, if not uh, April. But we're not in the Arctic here. This is not like the ground well, is going to thaw yeah, like that. Yeah, well, we have it's going to be thawed the day. We're, yeah, that's true. <laughs> but we always have those snowstorms in, in oh, March. Yeah. And so if we got to do some some gravel work or rock work and Actually, we get one of those late you storms. You know, the interesting so. thing is the... Um, after this freeze, they can't haul a certain load of cement or um, rock on that highway. The state puts a restriction on heavy loads hmm. uh, for a certain amount of time. Because I remember when we started building this house, the the rock guy um, said, well, I got to wait 10 days until or whenever the state pulls the weight restrictions off. Because I think once they thaw, they, they're kind of the under rock or under part of this road is um kind of get soft and they yeah. wait for it to settle it makes sense so huh. you're right interesting the road that you are gonna have to wait for the <laughs> ground to thaw hey, it sounds uniquely alaskan too but yeah, yeah that's a lot more like a, cool. a, a north one than than down yeah. here but um yeah and the, the builder wants to go pretty quick um well he wants to work hard doesn't want to like you know cut corners and just get it done but he wants to have it dried in by beginning of summer yeah, that way good. with uh plumbing and electrical it might be difficult to get a hold of people because summer's pretty busy. So right. that gives us a lot more time and we're not desperate for it. So the later we would start, then, you know, we can, we'd be less, le or more stressed. So the earlier we start, the more we can kind of get it dried in by then. And then if summer slows down a little bit, um, then, you know, we're still, A, we can enjoy some of the summer. And then B, yeah. we can um, pick up and finish it up in um, in September. Yeah. October, November. December. So we'll look to be there on Easter. Yeah. Easter, yes. Yeah. Well, we, well, we three bedrooms, three baths, whatever. It's not that big. I think it'll be go, it'll go fast. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, my buddy Rob is or the builders. He's pretty excited about uh, about well, it and doesn't think it's going to be super complex. So when I graduated from college, I went and worked for a builder in the Maple Valley area, which is outside of Seattle, Kent, kind of southeast or whatever Seattle. And he was a track home builder. And he could, because the way they organize their building, they could build a that house, two story, three bedroom, two bath, you know, standard, you know, eighteen hundred, two thousand square foot home, three months, foundation mm. to done. Wow! But you had to have your subcontractors just lined up, boom, yeah, boom, 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 go. and there was no stop between each, yeah, you know, each um, subcontractor, but. 
So I think nine months is realistic for you. Yeah. Should be fun. When I was drawing it, like I don't have an architectural background, and so everything was just squares and rectangles and very, very simple, very, yeah. you know, pretty open. But, uh, yeah. Did you take any grass. inspiration from uh, certain things or a look that you wanted? Did you want like a, a lofted ceilings, uh, open, you know, open floor plans are real common now or the kitchen, dining room, living room are all one room? Um, there, there was definitely a lot of inspiration. There were things about this house I liked. And I really liked the idea of being able to, to salvage some stuff from around town. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, all right, well, how do I start collecting the stuff? How do I ask for it? Where do I store it? And then what am I going to do? How am I yeah. going to, you know, get it into shape to be incorporated in the house? Right. And I was like, I don't have the facilities for that. Yeah. Um, probably don't have the money. Probably don't have the time to be able to do that. <laughs> and then what if if I have this awesome beam that I want Rob to incorporate and then, Oh, the beam's not ready yet. So the whole thing is just, or it's not the right size. Not, or something. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there could be a huge um, problem or delay because of something I wanted to individualize this. And yeah. so um, a lot well, of those are all good insights because I was lucky that I had this huge warehouse that we worked out of. So every time I needed something, I just stored it right mm. there. And you're right. It took a bunch of time. We went and got that free use wood. We haven't got on that topic. But Amer all these Alaskans think they're going to go out and saw down their own trees and <laughs> mill them up and then put them in their house. I'm like, it's an amazing amount of work, you know. Yeah. Well, we had the ability. We had the boat to do it. We had the sawmill, the kiln, the space. And I still think, would I do that again? I don't know if I'd do it. <laughs> it was a lot of work. Yeah. Uh, so there, there's some opportunities, I guess, the things that I would that I would want to do. But, you know, is it possible for us? Are we going to be able to? And so... Um, but as far as design stuff, you know, just kind of look around and stuff, that'd be cool, but it's just not going to be practical. And so I don't know if I'm sad about it, but it's just, you know, it's the reality. So. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's not the, there's not, it doesn't mean it's out of the question. You could always put out a, a little ping to people you know and like and say, hey, if you come across X, Y, or Z, we we're thinking about this, you know, and it doesn't have to be part of the, actual framing or structure of the house but it could be an element of the house like mm -hmm. you want a piece of wood for uh, 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 for your railing or you want a countertop slab you know i see you know talk to dave he said maybe he can make you a countertop slab for your island mm -hmm. you know th those elements are out there you just have to kind of start pinging people a little bit ahead of time yeah that's the cool thing about here is there's so many people that are doing unique sort of things like it's not just Who's yeah. the one person who does it? And like everybody yeah. or a lot of people have insights or access to stuff, and they're willing to share to either ideas or resources and stuff, which is which is pretty cool. Which reminds me, I have a bunch of <laughs> I have a little uh, squirrel nest of oh. building materials over there. We might have to walk or walk through your plan one day, and okay. I think uh, I have this beautiful um, wide piece of spruce that would. I, I, it would be would be nice for like a, a countertop in a bathroom or a bar countertop. Mm. Real nice. I think it's maybe twenty inch wide. Um, anyway, cool. we'll, go, we'll go look at that. That might be something you can use. Yeah, you don't have a lead on another fire pole. Um, no, but that's neat. I think you could find. I think you'd find that. Huh. We yeah. don't have. We don't have a space for yeah, it. Well, but, uh, maybe, okay. maybe on the outside. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe we'll figure that out. You know what would be cool? I, well, once you get me going on this, you can't get me started. <laughs> I think that kelp handrail that they did at the uh, the Arts Council, Rich Stage did that. Have you, have you ever noticed that? I have not noticed oh that. Oh, my God. Get off your ass. No, go down on Main Street, and there's a, he took a piece of copper, and he made this really cool. Huh. Um, it's, the, it's a piece of kelp, and then it has the fronds going down, kind of the cement part of it. But that's the handrail going up. And, you know, you could... You could do something like that as far as a little cool feature on your railing going up your stairs or, you know, start dreaming. Yeah, I think we'd have to do enough unique things to make it like, it's like, oh, so rather than like a, a where's Waldo or like one random thing, like everything <laughs> about this is like a sterile, straightforward, Run home middle, by Lowe's, yeah. and then... Like There's the one thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> like that's we, we we basically we blew our wad on that. Yeah, that was right. our one artistic I'm element. Take an abalone shell and screw it to the wall. And, yeah. Oh look, it's it's an Alaska cabin well, now. <laughs> actually, I like that. That's what I'll probably have to do. Yeah, but 
Well, I mean, that really goes with your theme as the mediocre. Alaska. Yeah, exactly. It does. I mean, yeah. But I'll t- I'll keep referring to it as the cabin. Well, you could, you know, yeah, you could drag in one glass ball and put it in your entryway. Yeah. You know? uh, Got to get a piece of baleen. Or, like, yeah, baleen or maybe one of those crab corks you find on the beach yes. somewhere, you know, from Canada. Yeah. yeah. Hang, a, hang a crab pot. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I just actually make the legs of the coffee table. Out of something. Like, just. Yeah, you know, like an old uh, an old crab pot. Yeah, just uh, just put a slab on top of that, or weld together a couple anchors. You yeah. know, and and you'd have your coffee table. So that's all after the construction is done. Matter just fact, add. I I think you could just you could basically have this solved and done if you just go down to what's her name's uh, uh, shop downtown, uh, Mikey uh, uh, Meffenberger's. Uh, what she call it? Anyway, she's got a little found and lost kind of store mm. there. Yeah. Got some maritime elements. Yeah, some of that stuff is cool. Some of the stuff is trash. And I yeah. don't know. Some of it's. Yeah. Well, anyway. Yeah. Then don't we'll see get, how it don't turns give out. up on the dream. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks uh, for being on it, man. Appreciate it. Jeez. And uh, You're welcome. Yeah, it was a it good was a pleasure. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about home building in the next uh, 9 to 12 months. All right. <laughs> well, thanks, man. Yeah.